All right, All right Dr. Van Muldren, I think you're ready to go. Uh, everyone, this is Dr. Van Muldren. He's the assistant medical director up at uh, Dublin, also an EMS medical director, and uh, excited to have him talk to us about unusual medical emergencies. So, Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, so, for those that don't know me, I'm Nick Van Muldren. Uh, I'm one of the Dr. Moe's. I'm the vice chair at um, Dublin, um, as far as EMS or emergency medicine is concerned. Um, so I just have a topic here that we're going to discuss uh, a couple of unusual medical emergencies. They're pretty rare, but uh, you'll see them uh, and it's paramount that, um, you know, get them to us fast. That way we can get to the, um, the root of the problem and uh, get things moving as they can be uh, quite uh, morbid and uh, have consistent mortality associated with them. So uh, here we go. Basically, what I said. Um, so, the topics we're going to discuss we're going to discuss uh, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, Guillain Barre syndrome, uh, Marfan syndrome, um, sickle cell anemia, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, tetanus, toxic shock, to toxic shock syndrome, and pulmonary fibrosis. So, neck fasci, uh, this is the flesh eating bacteria that you always hear about um, on the news. Uh, uh, basically, it's an infection of the deep uh, soft tissues. Uh, it progresses to destruction of the fascia and the subcutaneous fat. Uh, it's difficult to visualize. Um, basically, when they come in, it, it won't look that bad. It looks like cellulitis. Uh, but they'll have some other telltale signs that this may be something more um, sinister than just your from the mill cellulitis. Um, sometimes they'll get a little bit of anesthesia with it, um, where they really can't feel over the, the area that's affected. Um, and then ultimately they'll get necrosis, and that's usually a later sign uh, where they start to get some uh, purple, blackish type changes of the skin. So, um, some of the conditions that are optimal for infection obviously, you have to have some way for the infection to get into the skin. So, you'll usually have some sort of abrasion, uh, trauma to the area that allows the bacteria to get um, in the subcutaneous area. Um, it's usually in immunocompromised people. You'll see it more in diabetics, uh, obese uh, people are also more prone to develop this. Um, um, the bacteria can be either be one bacteria or multiple bacteria uh, that affect this, uh, and they have a little bit of different outcomes. Uh, the most common are bacteroides and the clostridium. Um, most of these bacteria we have on our skin, part of a normal flora, um, but with the abrasions or trauma to the skin, that bacteria can get in places where it's not supposed to be, the subcutaneous material spread, cause significant infection and ultimately significant morbidity. So some of the risk factors, obviously, we discussed some trauma, abrasions. Uh, people have recent surgeries, uh, obviously with surgery you have um, uh, opening of the skin. So this is another portal, uh, just like uh, you'd have with trauma. Uh, obesity, um, obviously the, the look, some of the larger people um, have, um, uh, just um, poor uh, hygiene and it increases their um, ability to uh, get rid of some of the normal flora that we have on our skin, increases the risk for infection. Diabetes, obviously diabetes increases your risk for uh, multiple disease processes um, and then ultimately affects your outcome. Uh, your poor wound healing increases your risk for um, getting the infection underneath the skin. Alcoholism is also a factor. Um, that's mostly just, uh, you know, secondary to um, immunocompromised state. Uh, there's a picture, uh, kind of a nasty looking um, thigh uh, that's kind of going in the perineum there. Um, so, uh, a lot of things that can kind of show up. Uh, one of the things you see is erythema. You see it about 72% of people. A lot of times you won't have the real sharp margins that you'll see with cellulitis. They'll be kind of rag uh, ragged and, um, Kind of very difficult to find the edge. Um, you'll see edema that extends beyond the visualized uh, erythema. So you'll see the swelling that'll happen uh, proximal to the uh, areas that are actually red or discolored. Uh, that happens about 75% of the time. Uh, there's also um, severe pain. All these people will complain of a lot of pain that you just think is way out of proportion to what you're looking at. Um, about only 60% of these people have fever. Uh, crepitus, which is when you kind of feel like that weird, like popcorn, like bubbly wrap kind of sensation underneath the skin. Um, they'll have about 50% of the time. Uh, you'll get some skin necrosis, some boule, 
which are kind of like the bubble like uh, looking uh, skin changes and uh, ecchymosis or bruising in about 38% of the patients. Um, so as far as testing, uh, one of the big things we do is imaging um, x-rays and CT scans will show the gas that isn't that obvious on exam. Uh, and at that point, uh, that needs to go directly to the operating room uh, for uh, debridement and excision. Uh, labs can somewhat help. Um, some of these people will get hyponatremia or low sodium. Um, some of them will have significant elevated white counts. Um, you'll see... Um, you know, other um, things that are abnormal as far as like diabetes, a lot of these people be very hyperglycemic. Um, so, but the most important thing is obviously the clinical exam. If you're concerned that this could represent uh, neck fash, you need to call a surgeon, you need to get him in there uh, to debride the area um, or size the, the, the tissue that's affected. So, you really shouldn't delay if you're thinking that you have this uh, for any imaging or lab studies. Uh, so, the treatment is uh, antibiotics. You want to cover a broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, you want to cover with a penicillin based or um, uh, carbapenem based medication. Uh, usually, we like to use uh, Zosin for that. Um, you also want to cover for MRSA. Uh, usually, that'll include uh, vancomycin. Uh, and then you also want to cover with uh, clindamycin because some of the bacteria that uh, cause this um, can also release toxins that uh, clindamycin works really well against. Uh, but the ultimate treatment is surgical debridement. Um, the other thing you also want to correct uh, in the meantime is is the uh, kind of resuscitation. Uh, a lot of these people will be hypotensive, they'll look shocky, they'll look toxic. So fluids um, and uh, any pressors that may be needed are also uh, warranted in the situation. Um, so a specialized form of um, uh, necrotized fasciitis of the perineum, something called Fournier's gangrene, uh, can occur as a result of the bre uh, breach in the integrity of the uh, gastrointestinal or urethral mucosa. It's, uh, this infection is primarily involving the groin of the perineum. Uh, it's, it uh, accelerates a lot more rapidly than uh, the extremity infections that you'll see with the neck fasci. Um, can spread to the interabdominal wall and into the, the glute gluteal region of the buttocks. Um, usually affects the scrotum and the penis in men and then the labia in women. Um, these people have significant um, uh, post surgical changes uh, as a result of the significant excision of their um, genital area. There's a little picture of that. Um, so, some of the factors. Uh, to show increased mortality uh, with neck fascia or significant white blood cell count of over 30,000. Uh, they'll have a left shift uh, with increased uh, bands, neutrophils. Um, they'll have a creatinine or kidney failure. Uh, it's usually over two. Um, they're, if they have an age over 60, they have significant mortality. Uh, and then if there's a um, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome associated with it, it also increase your morbidity. Um, the most common, uh, and the most deadly of the um, bacterial variants is the clostridial um, um, form. Um, there's also uh, increased risk of mortality with uh, delaying surgery, if, especially if it's over 24 hours. Really, these people shouldn't be in the ER for more than about, you know, just a few hours before they go to surgery. Uh, most of that delay is just getting the OR ready and then the surgeon ready to do the surgery. Um, but Immediately after we determine that they have neck fascia, these people usually go pretty quick. Um, and then the other areas that, that have high mortality are obviously the head and the neck, or the thorax, and the abdomen, just because of the close proximity to the, um, the components of the chest. Um, so the mortality rate uh, with polymicrobial or more than one bacteria is about 21%, um, with Fournier's gangrene involving the perineal area, uh, you see up to about 40% of these people. Uh, we'll have significant more mortality and uh, some other areas of cervical necrosing um, fasciitis and the neonatal. Um, they have significant mortality as well. Uh, the neck, uh, obviously, just because of the proximity to the head. Uh, then there's the mono uh, microbial or just one bacteria uh, has a little bit lesser um, uh, mortality rate, about 14 to 34 uh, percent. 
So uh, what can you do prior to the hospital? Obviously it's the ABCs, you know, the airway breathing, um, any kind of resuscitation that may be needed. Uh, again, these people can be uh, very toxic, uh, look very sick, will need fluids, maybe even pressors, um, try to cover the wound. Um, uh, any pressors obviously are needed um, if the you know fluids aren't really improving things and then get them there as fast as possible uh, to get to the ultimate place where they need to be, which is the OR. All right, uh, so the next topic here uh, is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, it's an immune-mediated polyneuropathy. Uh, it usually affects the peripheral nerves. Um, it's actually the most common cause of acute weakness and paralysis. Um, it's usually preceded by an illness uh, such as a URI or a diarrheal illness, uh, usually preceding a week or two before. Um, uh, it's, you hear about it uh, sometimes associated with the vaccinations. And, you know, you sign off on that when you get your, anytime you get a vaccination, you know, the flu vaccine uh, talks about, you know, have you ever had Guillain-Barre? Uh, it's pretty rare. It only happens about one in a million, actually. Um, but it is something that they've noticed that is associated with it. Uh, maybe complicated in the fact that it, it leads to respiratory dysfunction, um, uh, paralysis mostly of the diaphragm, uh, which obviously will end you up on a, a ventilator. Um, you can get autonomic uh, dysfunction. Um, you get anything from hypotension to hypertension, tachycardia, bradycardia. Uh, so it's it's really strange how it affects the nerves uh, and the fact that it can cause so much uh, issue with the regulation of um, your heart and uh, you know circulation. Uh, so basically, it's uh, any of the myelinated uh, nerves that are uh, can be affected: the motor, the sensory, the cranial, and the sympathetic. Um, so it's basically an uh, involvement of the myelin and the uh, Schwann cells and the peripheral myelin. Uh, it causes demyelination. It uh, starts the level of the nerve roots. Uh, it causes the infiltration of the epineural and endoneural small vessels uh, that are activated by the T cells. And uh, this causes macrophage mediated uh, demyelination and uh, immunoglobin uh, deposition on the uh, myelin and Schwann cells. Um, the demyelination blocks the conduction of the nerve and then ultimately leads to the muscle weakness. Um, it is pretty rare, obviously. It only happens to one or two people in 100,000. It can affect any age, um, but it's worse uh, in the older population. Uh, affects uh, both sex uh, equally. Um, usually these uh, people, about two thirds of them will have some sort of URI or a GI diarrheal illness um, uh, and within the last four weeks, um, uh, about 74% of them uh, will have that. Um, the Campylobacter associated Guillain-Barre syndrome it has the worst prognosis, but it's also associated with uh, cytomegalovirus, um, influenza, HIV, COVID-19, and then the post vaccinations. Um, usually, these people will present up to four weeks after the original uh, diarrheal or URI um, episode. Uh, they present with ascending paralysis. Uh, it's symmetrical. About 90% of the cases will involve the legs. They'll talk about how their feet and then their lower legs will be involved, uh, and it progresses upward uh, towards the chest. Um, I, it also can affect the uh, respiratory uh, system, diaphragm, and these people end up on the ventilator um, just because of uh, the body's inability to keep up with breathing, um, secondary to the uh, muscle involvement there. Uh, it can affect the face up to 50% of the time. Uh, these people, one of the telltale signs of Guillain-Barre is uh, they don't have reflexes or poor reflexes, uh, and that's just because of the um, the myelin and the, the nerve roots being affected, uh, so we can't uh, send the, the the nerve uh, signals down to the muscles, and therefore you can't uh, get the reflexes. Um, you get the autonomic dysfunctions, which we talked about, um, and cause anything from hyper, uh, hypertension to uh, um, hypotension and uh, bradycardia to tachycardia. It's very um, it's variable, uh, but obviously you need to correct any of these uh, abnormalities with fluids or any kind of pressors or uh, any hypertensive medications. Um, so, some of the different variants, uh, you can get acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy, uh, which is most common in North America and Europe. And this is our typical ascending paralysis, which I've just described. 
Uh, there's some other forms of, uh, such as Miller Fisher syndrome. Uh, it's paralysis that starts in the eyes and affects the gait, uh, your inability to walk. Uh, it's not as common here in the US, but it's pretty common in Asia and Europe. Um, some of the, there's another form called acute motor axial neuropathy, uh, which is uh, less common in the US, uh, more common in China, Japan. Uh, we probably don't see this. So the most common thing is the, uh, um, the acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy, which is the ascending, which we're probably gonna see you, uh, at least here in the United States. Uh, so to diagnose this, um, it's mostly a clinical diagnosis, obviously, uh, like I told you with the um, reflexes, these people will have decreased or no reflexes, especially in the patellar uh, tendon. Uh, so if you have that, you should have a high clinical suspicion. Um, but some of the other ways we kind of can uh, confirm our diagnosis is a lumbar puncture. Um, you know, you stick a needle in the back, get a little bit of CSF, um, and um, you have elevated protein, but normal white blood cell count. Uh, a lot of times you're doing this to rule out other things um, that can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy or um, paralysis. Uh, so some of the things that uh, can be associated with um, paralysis involving lower extremities is like a transverse myelitis, which is an infection that involves the um, uh, spinal cord. Um, but with that, you'll you'll see an elevated white count, so that's why it's important to do a CSF um, lumbar puncture. You can also do nerve conduction studies, uh, electromyelograms, uh, determine if there's uh, some other weird nerve thing going on besides uh, what you think is Guillain Barre. Uh, some of the other things like inflammatory markers can also help out in diagnosing uh, transverse myelitis, uh, epidural abscesses, and things that can put um, pressure on the spinal cord um, that can present in similar fashion. Uh, so some of the mimics, uh, like I just described, uh, you can get uh, B12 and th uh, thymine deficiencies, uh, which can cause uh, peripheral neuropathies. Um, these are easily detected uh, with, um, you know, blood work. Uh, you can do B12 and thymine levels. You can uh, do a CDC, which can show um, signs of that. Um, chronic alcoholism can get peripheral neuropathy, um, mostly affecting the hands and the feet. Um, you can also get uh, Lyme disease uh, and tick paralysis. Uh, which is kind of strange, but uh, if you get bit by a tick, you can get um, some paralysis involving the um, extremities. Uh, but once you remove the tick, uh, the process seems to resolve. Um, so obviously physical exam is paramount and determine if they have a tick on them. Uh, so uh, transverse myelitis uh, is the other thing that I kind of talked about before. Um, it's an infection of the um, spine that can cause similar kind of symptoms. Uh, so treatment, um, you treat uh, any abnormal blood pressure or um, uh, heart rate issue with, you know, fluids or pressors or hypertension medications as you see fit. Um, it's pretty obvious once you do the vital signs and to keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, you obviously need to keep an eye on the respiratory status. Uh, the, um, as it progresses uh, from lower extremities up to um, uh, the abdomen into the chest, you can involve the diaphragm. Uh, these people have decreased respiratory drive, um, will ultimately, you know, require, you know, BiPAP and then likely intubation uh, if it progresses to the diaphragm to the point where they are not breathing well. Uh, you can uh, treatment with uh, IVIG uh, and plasma exchange, um, which is way above my head as far as, uh, you know, what that does um, within the body to help reverse uh, what's going on there. Um, so it's a devastating disorder, um, a very slow recovery. It can take months to years to recover from, um, 30% have residual weakness at three years. Um, 3% will have relapsing muscle weakness or tingling, um, at some point later, uh, only about 80% uh, walk independently afterwards, uh, and only 50% recover uh, fully after one year. Um, 10% have severe impairment. Um, some of the pre-hospital things you can do is obviously the early recognition, uh, ABCs, correct uh, any autonomic instability and avoid any further injury uh, because these people will have paralysis. So, you know, if you don't uh, kind of help them along, they can have, you know, further falls and uh, injuries, uh, which ultimately uh, can lead to decreased morbidity or increased morbidity. Um, the next topic would be uh, Marfan syndrome. Uh, 
Uh, it's, a, it's an inherited connective tissue disorder. Uh, it's autosomal dominant uh, fibrinolin um, disorder. Uh, limits the uh, body's ability to make proteins uh, needed to build connective tissue. Um, happens about one in 3,000 to 5,000 people in the United States. And there's about uh, 200,000 people in the US with it now. Um, it's one of the most common um, gene malformations. Uh, there's no difference in male or female. Uh, it's usually diagnosed earlier in life, but some people don't get diagnosed till um, later on. And usually these people will present with other things like the aortic dissections that uh, cause them to kind of look further into their uh, genetic uh, makeup. Um, so these people are, uh, have a decreased lifespan. Uh, most people don't leave, live to be about 60. If you go undiagnosed and have a significant, um, um, you know, other problems associated with connective tissue disorder, such as the aortic dissection, these people only live about 30, 40 years old. Um, the major morbid morbidity is the uh, aortic dissection and the heart related uh, issues. Um, Abraham Lincoln, he has the typical, you know, Marfan syndrome um, body type. He's got the really long extremities, um, uh, kind of a caved in chest, um, and a weird shaped uh, frontal uh, bone or uh, head. Um, these people are very tall, um, they're very long uh, fingers and arms. Uh, so the, the kind of caved in chest, which we, we kind of see the, um, um, significant um, cave-like abnormality of the um, uh, chest is called the pectus excavum. Um, they have increased wingspan. These people have significant wingspan in relation to their uh, height. Um, they also have uh, arachnodactyly, which is kind of like the spider-like fingers. They have really long uh, fingers um, and elongated skull, which is kind of like a protrusive, kind of thin or frontal um, uh, skull. Um, they'll have vision changes um, and ocular problems. Uh, these people have increased risk for a lens dislocation. Uh, and they'll have flat cornea, so like the fr front part of their eye will actually be very flat. Um, so these people can present with sudden vision changes um, as a result of the lens um, or the focusing part of the eye kind of dislocating uh, into the eye itself. So there's a picture there of the uh, rectum dactyly, uh, which is the spider-like fingers. Um, this is a picture of the lens dislocation. You can see how the, the circular part uh, uh, right there behind the, uh, the retina there is kind of dislocated posteriorly. Um, then you can see these other uh, pictures with the lady with the long arms. Um, looks like she can kind of scratch her knees kind of thing. Um, who have uh, increased, increased uh, arm span or wingspan. Um, so, as far as the major thing that we worry about with Marfan syndrome is uh, a, uh, aortic dilatation, um, where you get a dilation of the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that comes off the, the heart. Um, with that, you can get increased risk for dissection, which is a, an appropriate tearing of the, the wall of the aorta, um, which has very high um, mortality rate. Um, you can um, also get mitral valve prolapse with this. This is uh, the secondary connective uh, tissue um, properties associated with Marfan's. Uh, these people present with, um, you know, uh, heart failure, um, pulmonary edema, that sort of thing. Um, these people also, because they're very tall, skinny, have connective tissue disorders, will present with a uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, so obviously that requires any um, you know, needle decompression or chest tube as needed, um, especially if there's a tension involved. Um, the aortic dissection is just a picture showing the different areas that can kind of tear. Um, so they'll usually present obviously with the sudden onset of uh, chest pain. Uh, a lot of times it'll have radiation to the neck or the back or the arms. Um, and it's usually a tearing type sensation. Um, they can have the, with the lens dislocation, you have vision changes. Um, uh, you can have syncope, which is um, uh, usually associated with people that are having aortic dissections. Um, uh, that's just because of the sudden uh, pain or um, the uh, autonomic instability that can occur with um, the aortic dissection. Um, there's uh, sudden dyspnea and decreased breath sounds, which you know are associated with uh, pneumothorax. 
uh, which can uh, be treated uh, pre-hospital, especially if there's a tension involved. Um, so the way we diagnose morphans, you, know, you can do a CT scan to evaluate the aorta, determine if there's any uh, dilation or um, dissection. Uh, EKG, uh, mostly to rule out any other forms of chest pain, um, you know, MI, um, or anything else that can be causing uh, the chest pain that, that is not uh, the aortic dissection. Um, an echocardiogram can also be used to just evaluate the aortic root, um, and the heart itself, and the contractility. Um, chest X-ray, obviously, you can rule out uh, pneumothorax. Um, you can have an ophthalmology evaluation as if you're concerned about any lens dislocation. Um, and then uh, other forms of uh, chest pain that uh, you're ruling out, um, cardiac markers, um, uh, blood work to, for pericarditis, um, myocarditis, that sort of thing. Um, so the treatment is obviously to manage the blood pressure and um, heart rate. Um, the, these people, if, if they have significant um, tachycardia and elevated blood pressure, this can uh, increase their risk of morbidity. Uh, because the small tears uh, that uh, are present with the aortic dissection will actually propagate and move distally uh, through the aortic arch uh, down into the abdomen, abdominal aorta, uh, if the blood pressure and the heart rate are, are controlled. So one of the major things we do in the ER is um, obviously put these people on um, medications to help control their heart rate and blood pressure like uh, um, until the, the vascular surgery team can um, do their thing. I go in and kind of make any repairs or stints. Um, uh, you got to monitor the neurological status. Um, this, with the aortic dissection, you'll have um, um, the dissections can even go into um, the carotid arteries, for tube arteries, that sort of thing. Uh, and this can lead to clots that uh, kind of form and propagate up to the brain, cause uh, stroke-like symptoms. Um, so. Sometimes these, these people that present with neurological symptoms and uh, chest pain, you have to think about uh, aortic dissection uh, and ultimately morphans as the root cause. Um, like I said before, any kind of pneumothorax, you could treat with a needle decompression if you're thinking tension or chest tube, uh, depending on their um, stability uh, in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, and then ophthalmology, obviously be consulted in any kind of invo involvement of the eye or the lens. Uh, so, yeah, just the ABCs, IV fluids, uh, pressors if, if needed, to, if they're hypotensive. Um, uh, EKG, um, you know, access for uh, breath sounds, and then monitor for any neurological changes or autonomic and, um, abnormalities. Um, so, the next topic here is uh, sickle cell anemia. It's an inherited disease of the red blood cells. Uh, it's a result of uh, beta globin uh, gene mutation. These people have crescent-shaped uh, red blood cells. It's most common in uh, people of African descent. It's actually one in 12 African-Americans that carry a sickle cell trait. Uh, you also see it in uh, Latino-Americans, um, um, Saudi uh, people from Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, India, and uh, Mediterranean descent. Uh, there's about uh, nine, 90 to 100,000 Americans that have uh, sickle cell. Um, they have it from birth, and most people know they have it or are a carrier um, when they present um, through EMS and in the ER. Um, they'll tell you about how they have a, a plan in place uh, to kind of treat their um, sickle cell crisis or pain. Uh, mostly people tend to go to a high state because they have a um, specialty there of sickle cell anemia, but they will show up to some of the peripheral places as well. Um, Here's a picture of um, some uh, sickling. So you can see the, the kind of um, abnormally shaped um, um, blood cells there. And they ultimately can kind of, because they're not round, it can kind of get uh, caught in uh, places where the vasculature kind of bifurcates or, or branches. Uh, it can cause um, clotting that focuses in that area, can back up uh, approximately. That causes the vasoclusive uh, crisis or the pain that you associate with sickle cell anemia. Um, so, uh, the clinical presentation that leads to the diagnosis of sickle cell is um, they'll have swelling in their hands and their feet. Um, uh, they'll also have uh, fever sometimes, uh, when infants. Um, they'll have uh, fatigue and they'll look pale. Um, they'll have dyspnea, difficulty breathing. Most of these are just symptoms of anemia. This is because of the poor. Um, uh, 
uh, hemoglobin um, and then the ability to transport oxygen. Um, you have um, splenic pain, so left upper quadrant pain, that's caused by splenic uh, um, sequestration, uh, which is when the uh, sickle cells kind of get stuck in the, the spleen as well, um, causes anemia. Um, you have yelling of the skin and eyes, that's due to breakdown of the blood cells, um, they'll look jaundice, um, you'll have, um, scleral icterus or yelling of the eyes. Um, they have delayed growth in puberty uh, as a result of the anemia. Um, so some of the complications you'll see with uh, sickle cell, um, there'll be a, anemia that requires blood transfusion. Um, they'll have uh, stroke-like symptoms uh, cause the, the vaso-occlusive uh, crisis kind of picture where the uh, cells are kind of clogging up the vasculature and cause ischemic um, strokes. Um, you can get priprism, uh, which is uh, a sustained erection uh, as a result of um, the sickling of the red blood cells within the vasculature of the uh, penis itself. Um, these people will need a urology evaluation as um, you can get, um, obviously, uh, necrosis and, and um, significant ischemia of the, the penis as a result of it. Um, you get to infections from poor wound healing. Um, you get acute chest syndrome, which is something we worry about with sickle cell anemia. Uh, it has a presentation similar to pneumonia. These people present with chest pain, cough, fever. Um, it's due to uh, infection and trapped uh, sickling cells uh, within the lungs. Uh, so they'll even have a, an x-ray uh, in the right lower uh, portion of the picture there that shows, it looks like a kind of a fogging of the right upper lung there, kind of similar to uh, pneumonia. Uh, they'll have the fever, chest pain, hypoxemia, wheezing, respiratory stress. It all looks like uh, pneumonia, but with a history of sickle cell, you need to think about acute chest syndrome. Uh, again, they can have the poor wound healing. Um, uh, that's just because of increased infection from the abnormalities of the spleen, uh, but also the uh, anemia uh, and poor blood supply associated with sickle cell. Um, obviously, you need to treat that with antibiotics, IV fluids, any kind of resuscitation, um, especially if they're toxic or septic. Uh, splenectomy uh, may be needed as well, um, which also increases the risk for uh, infection. Uh, the next topic would be uh, tuberculosis. It's a bacterial infection. Uh, it's usually caused by um, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, uh, usually affects the lungs, um, but can affect other parts of the body, lymph nodes, kidneys, bones. Um, there's 10 million uh, new cases each year. Uh, there's 1.2 million children that are affected. Uh, some of the countries with high tuberculosis uh, rates uh, are China, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and South Africa. Um, you get to worry about these people who uh, frequently travel uh, back and forth, uh, especially if they're uh, recent immigrants, as they um, can be exposed there and bring it back uh, um, to the United States and to their families here. Uh, these are also new immigrants that you'd have to worry about um, just because coming from a high uh, endemic area. Um, so you should have a high clinical suspicion for um, somebody with uh, URI type symptoms, uh, especially from some of these endemic countries. Um, so there's there was about 9,000 cases reported in 2018, and uh, this is up from about 500 in 2017. Um, some of the risks are socioeconomic. Uh, uh, people that are incarcerated, uh, people in close contact, uh, uh, especially from jails or, or um, high risk for uh, tuberculosis and spread. Uh, so that's another population that you should also be um, on high alert for in regards to tuberculosis. 60% um, of cases uh, occur between ages of 25 and 64. Uh, it's also associated with uh, comorbidities such as HIV. Um, just be aware of that. I think they have a, uh, obviously a immunocompromised state, which increases the risk for developing and suffering from, you know, active tuberculosis. Um, so with pulmonary tuberculosis, you get productive cough, uh, maybe blood tinged. So anybody with homophysis, you should have high clinical suspicion for tuberculosis, um, uh, fever, uh, weight loss, um, 
You get meningitis from this. Uh, these people present with headaches, uh, nuclear rigidity or neck pain, uh, some mental status changes. Uh, you get uh, tuberculosis, of, tuberculosis of the spine. Uh, these people have back pain, stiffness. Um, get involved in the urinary tract, and get flank pain, epididymitis, um, involvement of the testicles, uh, and then GI tuberculosis, you'll get, um, you know, some diarrhea kind of changes. Uh, it's usually spread by droplets. Um, usually when somebody coughs or sneezes uh, in a close proximity to someone else, um, it spreads pretty easily. Uh, that's why it's very important to um, have these people have masks on to keep from um, spreading their active um, droplets to others. Uh, you can see some changes there on the lungs. Um, you can get some cavitary lesions. They kind of look like um, air cells within the, uh, like an infiltrative kind of state within the lung there on the bottom. You can see it in the right upper lobe there. Uh, treatment, uh, obviously, you prevent future spread. Uh, you need to mask these people. You need to uh, isolate them when they have active tuberculosis. Um, they need to be on antibiotics. Uh, up to six to nine months. Um, some of the treatments are isoniazid, uh, rifampin, ethamibule, uh, and um, pyrazinamide. Um, it's typical, it's typical uh, for them to be on all four antibiotics at the same time. And it's a very hard disease to treat. Uh, next topic is uh, malaria. Um, these people present kind of similar to the tuberculosis, like fever, URI type kind of symptoms. Um, they'll come from endemic areas as well. Uh, it's usually caused by a mosquito bite that uh, introduces the parasite itself into the body. Um, symptoms usually don't occur until about a week or uh, a few weeks later after they were bitten. Um, but the most common kind of uh, span is about 12 to 14 days after they were exposed. Uh, so these people will be exposed to another country, come back to the United States, uh, and be back here for about a week or two before they develop symptoms. So you need to ask about any pertinent uh, travel history um, when you're thinking about this. Uh, so here's a picture of most of the endemic areas in, in the world. Uh, you'll see most of it's in Central uh, Africa, uh, and then you know in India and um, some of the uh, Asian, the lower Asian um, countries there. Uh, as well as the upper portion of us, uh, you know, Brazil and um, South America there. Um, there is uh, some uh, symptoms that are associated with malaria that are not specific, but uh, include things such as tachycardia, tachypnea, um, fevers, chills, um, sweating, headaches, cough, uh, vomiting, um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, uh, myalgias. Um, so when they have severe uh, malaria is when you, they, you really need to be concerned because they can have um, ultramental status, um, seizures, um, they can have uh, respiratory depression, and this can lead to ARDS, or, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, there's uh, circulatory collapse, uh, metabolic acidosis that can happen, renal failure. These people have really dark urine, um, uh, called black water fever as a result of that. Um, and it's mostly because they're having um, some breakdown of the red blood cells that's so causing the urine to become really dark. Um, you, you have hepatic failure, uh, liver failure. These people present uh, jaundice sometimes. Um, you have co co coagulopathies. Uh, uh, so sometimes these people have DIC or disseminated in vascular um, uh, coagulation. These people will just bleed out um, of you know, blood in their gums. You'll stick an IV in, they'll bleed everywhere. Um, They'll cough up blood and that sort of thing. Uh, these people look very sick. Um, they'll have se severe anemia. They'll require, you know, transfusions, that sort of thing. Um, and then sometimes they'll even present with hypoglycemia. Uh, so you diagnose it usually with uh, laboratory testing, PCR. Um, uh, you'll have changes on CBC. Um, the, you know, anemia that you'll see, um, CMP will pick up any changes of the, you know, renal dysfunction or liver dysfunction, um, chest x-ray, uh, roll out other things that uh, are associated with the, the URI, uh, to roll out, you know, pneumonia, tuberculosis, other things. Uh, the PT, PTT, D-dimer uh, for the DIC, if you're concerned about that. Blood cultures, if there's any kind of sepsis component or worry for that. Uh, so you treat with uh, antibiotics, uh, or not antibiotics, but um, uh, anti-parasitics. Um, uh, um, 
chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. You've heard a lot about that with um, COVID, but uh, originally it was used to treat um, uh, malaria. Um, uh, most of the treatment is supportive, uh, especially if they don't have any of the severe symptoms uh, that I just mentioned. Um, and then they just people just need to be closely monitored for any disease progression. Uh, so next topic is tetanus, uh, an infectious disease. Uh, it's usually caused by a contaminated wound. Um, the bacteria is the Clostridium uh, tetani, uh, lives in soil. Um, that's why we worry about any kind of uh, lacerations that uh, occur, and we treat with um, you know the tetanus um, uh, booster um, just to kind of prevent this from occurring, uh, as is the lacerations can be exposed to to the tetanus itself. Um, uh, there's only about 50 to 100 cases per year in children. Um, a lot of times, that, that's very low, secondary to the widespread immunization. Um, developed countries, there's many more cases uh, per year as uh, because of the poor immunization status. Um, there's four possible types of tetanus. You can get um, generalized tetanus, which affects all the skeletal muscles. Um, it's uh, very the most common and severe. Um, there's local, local tetanus, which would get kind of spasms of the area around the wound itself. Um, there's uh, cephalic tetanus, which uh, primarily affects the face and the scalp. Um, so people have uh, significant changes of their face where it looks like they're kind of scared all the time um, or shocked. Um, there's neonatal tetanus, uh, which usually affects infants less than one month. Um, so some, this is generalized tetanus where you'll get some spasms of the spine, they'll arch their back, they'll have, um, despite the, the, the spasms in their back, they'll also have um, spasms in their abdomen. Uh, so it's highly concerning if they're presenting with a kind of an arched back and uh, have a tightened abdominal wall as well. Uh, they'll have contractions of their upper extremities where they'll kind of flex as well, uh, as well as their lower extremities. Uh, localized tetanus, you'll kind of see some spasm and contractions of the, the fingers, but have difficulty opening and closing their hand, uh, especially if they have a laceration that involves the hand. Um, cephalic tetanus is what I was talking about with the kind of scared or shocked kind of look uh, where they can't kind of close their mouth. Um, that's just because of the spasms of the facial muscles. Um, Neonatal tetanus, it's very rare, but that presents kind of similar to the adults with a kind of arched back and um, kind of contractures of the extremities. Uh, so some of the injuries that are prone to tetanus, uh, frost, frostbite, uh, people that are post-operative, um, you have crush wounds, um, abscesses, um, uh, can happen after childbirth. Um, tetanus is pretty common after IV drug users. Um, because of the penetration of the, the skin itself, but also because of the um, poor hygiene that they use with their needles sometimes. Um, it can happen after insect bites um, and then chronic sores, you know, diabetic wound, uh, you know, especially the feet. Uh, uh, so some of the hallmark features are muscle rigidity and spasms. Uh, you'll get um, irritability, muscle cramps, um, Usually the spasms are progressive. You get lockjaw with it, uh, which is when you can't really open your mouth or close your mouth appropriately. Um, it's what you always hear about with tetanus. Um, you get the spasms of the master muscles, muscles um, which um, kind of go up and down when you chew. Um, you get uh, weakness of uh, other facial muscles as well. Um, uh, the treatment is just supportive, um, airway management, uh, if needed, um, uh, you treat these people with benzodiazepines like Valium, especially for muscle spasm to help control the, um, uh, the spasm and the tetany of the muscles. Uh, this also helps with their pain. Barbiturates can also be effective, especially if these people you know, require intubation and sedation. Um, the, uh, mortality is about, uh, 50%, um, uh, once it actually occurs, uh, it's usually due to respiratory failure uh, or arrhythmias that can occur. Um, so the next topic is toxic shock syndrome. Um, it's a multi-system disease process, usually caused by staph aureus or group A strep, uh, first described in 1978. Um, in the 1980s, it was associated with uh, tampon use, so 
these people um, will usually come in with retained tampons, um, some that they don't even know that are in uh, within the vaginal bolt um, that ultimately uh, cause um, significant uh, uh, release of toxins uh, from the uh, different bacteria associated with it and ultimately can lead to a mortality, although it's only about 1.8%. In the uh, from that, uh, but generally, um, toxic shock once it's kind of spread diffusely, it's about um, uh, 30 to 70 percent. Uh, so they'll present with a uh, significant redness, uh, erythema, rashes, uh, they'll appear toxic, they'll be hypotensive, um, they'll have significant uh, myalgias, they'll have vomiting, diarrhea, headaches. Uh, it's people that are generally sick. Um, a lot of times, refractory uh, hypovolemic shock won't really respond to fluids. Uh, a lot of times, you, these people end up on pressors. Um, they'll end up with ARDS, uh, renal failure, uh, sepsis and bacteremia, um, electrolyte abnormalities, and uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, so the treatment for that would be supportive, um, you know, control the airway if needed, um, resuscitate with fluids, pressors if needed, uh, antibiotics uh, are paramount. Um, uh, they, uh, the antibiotics themselves help to prevent um, the toxins from um, doing their damage that are released from the bacteria uh, itself. Um, and then obviously you remove any offending agent such as the, removing the tampon if that's the, the root source. Uh, so the next topic is pulmonary fibrosis, um, which is a chronic progressive lung disease. Um, there's two different forms. There's idiopathic, which is, uh, has an unknown cause, and then there's the non-idiopathic, which usually is associated with other things, um, which is medical, such as chemicals or medications. Um, happens in about uh, up to 30 people per 100,000. Usually affects males more than females. Um, and that they have significant changes of their lungs, um, where it kind of causes hardening and uh, firmness of the lungs and it affects the ability to expand. So these people will present with respiratory stress, difficulty breathing, um, significantly more prone to develop um, uh, interlung infections such as pneumonia. Um, once they are diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, they have a significantly shortened lifespan. Uh, their median survival is only about three to five years after diagnosis. Um, so they, they can develop respiratory failure, right heart failure, uh, MIs, um, PEs, uh, and significant infections of the lung, uh, all as a result of the uh, hardening of the fibrosis of the lungs itself, making it in, you know harder for the, the heart to kind of pump against, um, and uh, obviously the, the harder for the lungs to expel any kind of uh, infectious agent uh, as they can, their cough is. Um, uh, decreased uh, as a result of the fibrosis and the, the ability to kind of expel the, the infection that they may be developing their lung. Um, they have progressive dyspnea, uh, uh, mostly with uh, exertion at first, but then can ultimately develop at rest. These people's uh, chest x-ray will look, look terrible. Uh, this person looks like they have diffuse infiltrates uh, and you can kind of see the um, kind of uh, speculated changes uh, within the inferior portion of the lung and the upper portion of the left lung there. Uh, the fibrosis that you can see on the chest x-ray. Uh, they'll have a non-productive cough. They'll have a uh, uh, flu-like illness, um, kind of present like flu and uh, pneumonia would. Uh, treatment's all supportive. Uh, oxygenate the patient if they need it. Uh, nasal cannula, non-rebreather, or intubation if, you know, in dire need of that. Uh, and then uh, they get into the emergency department, sometimes they'll put them on steroids, um, but uh, there's really not a whole lot that they can do uh, aside from a lung transplant um, to increase their uh, survivability or uh, decrease their mortality and morbidity. All right, well, that's all I got for you. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything. Sorry if I was going kind of fast there. Uh, Nick, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, uh, great presentation. That's uh, a lot of info. So uh, sometimes my experience over my years is that uh, we walk into these weird situations and go, uh, okay, I've heard of that. I know a tiny bit about it, but I really have no clue what to do. And I just think about the basics. So some of these people like the necrotizing uh, fasciitis and things like that, 
they seem to have a really good general assessment component, maybe even a sepsis management component, and an infection control component. Can you talk a little bit about each of those areas just in general for some of these type things? Yeah, so obviously with um, the, the sepsis component, um, these people will look shocky. Uh, they'll be, you know, um, hypotensive. They'll require fluid resuscitation. Uh, sometimes they'll even require pressure, uh, you know, pressors, you know, uh, kind of keep their blood pressure up. Um, the, the, what was the other portion uh, besides the sepsis that you asked about? Sepsis. Uh, probably just a good general approach and assessment overall, you know, don't forget the basics if you don't know what to do. And right. then there's clearly for certain things an infection control uh, uh, component probably. Right. So, you know, a lot of these people, they'll look like uh, just a run the mill, like uh, cellulitis kind of stuff, uh, especially in their legs and arms. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to have a high clinical suspicion. Um, Especially if they have like rapidly progressing, if they tell you that, you know, it just started yesterday with the, you know, their foot and then not now it's all the way up their leg. Um, you need to be a little bit more concerned about that. Um, these people, these people typically have a more sinister um, kind of presentation uh, than just the run of the mill cellulitis that's just progressing like slowly over the, you know, few days. Um, so the rapid progression and then the significant pain sometimes or that makes it, sense. Yeah, where if they're having like anesthesia where they can't feel really over the the area of that you think it looks like cellulitis, or if it looks it feels kind of strange underneath your your touch when you kind of palpate their their leg or their shin, uh, it'll kind of feel like there's like rice krispies underneath the skin. Um, uh, those people typically will have neck fash, um, so that should increase your you know. Or, you know, it should be more of a for, forefront of your, your thought process as far as it could be neck fashion as opposed to cellulitis. Any other questions? Sorry, Dr. Bamadra, I'll drop for just a second. Uh, yeah, that was some good uh, information. The only other thing I was thinking was uh, I've, I've got some personal experience with uh, pulmonary fibrosis patients. Uh -huh. And I found them be uh, to be uh, quite difficult to bag. Right. But what do you do about that? Well, How do you yeah. Much to date. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, with their their fibrosis, they'll have the hardening of their lungs, so they are more difficult to bag as a result of that because there's less complicity uh, of the lung tissue to kind of expand and. Um, um, so a lot of times you'll have to have increased uh, positive pressure ventilation, um, uh, you know, BiPAP. Uh, uh, we try not to intubate these people because it's very hard to get them off the, the uh, ventilator once they're on it. Um, but uh, yeah, increased, uh, you know, uh, positive pressure is typically the way you kind of uh, subvent that or, or get over the, the fact that it's difficult for them to bag. That sounds great. I think the CPAP BiPAP is a great idea, and we use that with a you know, a number of other patients, and it's it's typically quite successful, I believe, overall. Right. But we appreciate that. I don't see any questions in our QA or chat right now, so thank you for everything. It was a great topic, and I think it's also interesting to hear sometimes uh, about things we don't do on an everyday basis, so we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, and everyone else, uh, we are going to take about a five-minute break to get our next speaker ready. So run to the bathroom, go get a drink, whatever you do on these breaks, and uh, come right back. And uh, when we come back, Holly will introduce our next speaker. So we have about a five-minute break. Thanks, everyone. If you have questions, drop them in the chat or the Q&A. We're here for you in between or during the presentation. Uh, and then uh, we will also pop up evaluation information and CE information at the end of the conference. Uh, so make sure you stick around and watch your email following the conference. Thanks. We'll be back in just a few minutes. 